right, so tonight we are going to be halfway through with the book of Genesis. Halfway done. You didn't think we could make it. I know, when we started, you're thinking there's no way we're ever going to make it out of this book. Well, we'll be halfway done tonight if everything goes as planned, right? So tonight we're going to see in chapter 24 uh, and 25, we're going to shift focus. It's going to move away from the person of Abraham and Sarah uh, to the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah and the whole next generation. Now, remember, when God comes on the scene, he begins to speak to Moses and some of these other people. He's going to say, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So now we're seeing where all of this is forming. Abraham was the first generation. Now Abraham is dying off of the scene. Isaac's going to rise up. So we saw the birth of the, the promised child. We saw the sending away of Hagar, the servant. And now we're moving into chapter 24, where we're going to talk about how Abraham has been blessed by God in every way that God promised, every single way. And it sets the stage for this generational blessing of God to continue to flow out of the life of Abraham into the son, the promised son, Isaac. Genesis chapter 24, we'll start with verse 1. Now, Abraham was old. How would you like that to be the first thing mentioned just right off the bat? Abraham was old, well advanced in years. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. First of all, putting the hand under the thigh sounds a little weird, right? Put your hand, come here, put your hand under my thigh. Let me, well, that doesn't fly today, right? I mean, that, that's a harassment suit waiting to happen. So put your hand under my thigh was the way of the first century back in this time, the, the way that they would say, Stop and listen to what I'm saying, right? I want you, I'm, I'm basically going to sit on your hand so you can't run off. I want your undivided attention. We're going to talk and I'm going to ask you something very important. That was the idea behind put your hand under my thigh. And what was so very important to Abraham? Find my son a wife, but not from anybody. I don't want you to find a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, the land in which we're dwelling. I want you to find someone that's from my kindred, from, from our people, our group. He says, I don't want you looking for the daughters of the Canaanites. Why would he want a daughter of the Canaanites? Why would he not want that? They're idol worshipers, right? They're, they don't worship the one true God. This was a religious decision that he's making here. He doesn't want them to marry the daughters of the Canaanites because the daughters of the Canaanites worshipped idols. And he, would, he knew that there would be the possibility that his son could get drawn away from God Almighty. So he says, I want you to find someone that, that is a, a, a wife for my son from our, from our people who worship the one true God. In fact, I'm so sure God is going to lead you. He's talking to his servant. I'm so sure God is going to lead you. He's going to send his angel in front of you to make sure you pick the right woman. No pressure whatsoever. <laughs> right? No pressure. 
So you ever heard the saying that a picture's worth a thousand words? Well, I've, I've found that to be true, and I, I think every parent knows how important it is uh, when, when, when you're reading to your kids or you're reading anything, and the Bible is, is no different, that these things begin to emerge and these pictures begin to shine forth. And I think we have this beautiful picture right here where Abraham is commanding his servant to go and get a bride for his son. Now, just those words alone should, should spark some spiritual imagery in your head. How God the Father calls for his spirit to bring the bride, the church, the believers to his son, who is Jesus. So this picture begins to unfold right before our eyes that we can see this, this dualism that happens between what's happening with Abraham and his servant and Isaac and what happens for us, what the Lord does for us, that he sent his son for us. And by the spirit of God, we are drawn in, made part of the family of God. And when we come to know Jesus as our savior, the Bible calls the church the bride of Christ. So we're going to see that imagery all through here. So in this portrait, Abraham's going to represent God the Father. Isaac's going to represent Jesus the Son. And the servant, who's not named, represents the Holy Spirit. Now, why would the servant, who is unnamed, represent the Holy Spirit? Well, Scripture tells us that, that the Spirit of God never speaks of what? Himself. Ever. John 14, John 16, the Spirit of God exists to point everybody to whom? To Jesus, right? So it's a perfect picture. So Abraham's going to send his servant to find a bride for Isaac, just as the Holy Spirit tugs on our hearts, convicts us, draws us to Christ to be his bride, the church. Abraham's servant was to bring the bride to Isaac rather than taking Isaac to the bride. That's, that's very important to see, right? Because one day, too, we're going to join our bridegroom, Jesus, in his kingdom, right? He's going to call us to be with him, and forever then we will be with the Lord. Amen and amen. So, as symbolized by the servant, the Holy Spirit is never going to force any person against their will. Because what did Abraham tell the servant? Look, if the woman's not willing to follow you, then you're free from this oath of mine. How many of you guys felt like you were just forced by God to be a disciple of Jesus? You were just forced. None of us, right? Willingly, we came to the Lord our God, right? Willingly, because we were wooed. We were brought in. We were drawn in by the Lord himself. The, Contrary to what a lot of people think, the Holy Spirit is not a bizarre force that makes you do things you don't want to do. We are led by the Spirit of God. We are drawn by the Spirit of God. We are not forced at all by the Spirit of God. You know, one of the early revivals, um, goodness, early 1800s maybe, as, as the revival was moving out west, you had a lot of bizarre things that began to happen in some of these revivals. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the one. It was in Camp Creek, maybe, North Carolina, one of the revivals before they moved out west. I mean, no, this was in Kentucky. That's where it was. It was in Kentucky. Now you're like, oh, now I get it. Now I know why it was bizarre. <laughs> yes, it was in Kentucky. Grand move of God, Okay. People were showing up by the thousands, and all they says, we, we, we hear the sound of God. And it all started with this one Baptist woman. Get this. The Baptist and the Methodist were meeting for a joint revival service. That's a miracle in and of itself. You had Baptist and Methodist together. This one Baptist woman wanted to stay after revival and pray for the next night's meeting. Well, they let her stay. And there were a couple of deacons that said, look, we'll hang out too and we'll make sure nothing happens while she prays in here. Well, in the middle of her praying, she begins to, to, to do what the mountain women would do. That then, yep, yep. You know, she would yelp like that. Yep. She was just, she, uh, she felt moved by the Lord. The men started yelping. And they all began falling on their faces and crying out to God. 
the next morning, they were still praying. And there were probably six, seven hundred people had shown up that said, hey, we, we heard the sound of God coming out of these hills. Now, I don't know what the sound of God sounds like, but apparently it sounds like a hip. <laughs> and they began to gather. And this little country church couldn't hold all the people. And so they began meeting outside and more people would show up. Wagons of people would show up. And they said, we heard the sound of God coming out of these hills. Now, by this time, they were singing and there was preaching going on. And there were so many people that you couldn't preach to all of them. So they were cutting down trees and making stages out of them. And the guy would stand up and said, if you can hear me, I'm your preacher. And he would preach until he just couldn't preach no more. They'd pull him down, and put another one up. The worship leaders... They would, they would sing songs in rounds. Well, he would sing a line, and they'd sing it back. He'd sing a line, and they'd sing it back. And if you can hear me, I'm your worship leader. And so there was just these, all these different songs and all these different messages that were happening at the same time. You said, that sounds like chaos. Maybe it was, but man, people were getting saved by the droves. Well, just like any other legitimate move of God, things got bizarre. People started barking like dogs and clucking like chickens. And what, was, what made it so bad is they said, look, the Holy Spirit's making me do this, was the reply. To which it came hammering down, and this is when the revival kind of scattered, was that the Spirit of God never makes a person do anything. The Spirit of God leads us, guides us. Now, how come me to give you that revival history? I don't know, but it was fun. Let's move along. <laughs> Verse 10. <laughs> then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nehor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink and who shall say drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you've appointed for your servic, servant, Isaac. By this, I shall know that you've shown steadfast love to my master. My goodness. It's pretty pointed, isn't it? God, let the woman whom you've chosen, when I say, Will you give me water? She, she will say, yes, I will give you water and I will water your camels. That's how I will know that this, this is the woman that you've chosen. Now, I want you to note, even if it's a middle note or you're highlighting in your Bible, because I want you to note how this servant is praying, because he's going to recall this incident and it's not going to sound the same. Verse 15. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. And she said, drink, my Lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand to give him a drink. When she finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also. Ding, 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 ding. We found a winner. Tell her what she's won, Bob. Right? She quickly empties the jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all of his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. Okay, he just prayed very specifically for this to happen so that he would know. And when that very thing happened, he was still unsure. You've never been there, have you? It's a walk with the Lord. We are very unsure of ourselves. 
but God is always faithful. So Abraham's faithful servant, he did what he was told. He went to where Abraham's family lived. He stopped at a spring, and the servant prayed for God to provide. And before, I mean, as soon as he says amen, here comes this, this woman walking down. Very attractive, the Bible says, in appearance. And if you're like me, you're trying to follow the picture in your head. If Abraham's like God, Isaac's like Jesus, and uh, the Holy Spirit is like the servant, and then we are supposed to be the bride, and the bride is very attractive in appearance, you're, you're thinking there's no way because I know me, right? I, I know that I drop the ball constantly. I know that I miss the mark all the time. There's no way, spiritually speaking, right, that we're very attractive. And, and, and I get that. But in the perspective of the Father, in the perspective of the one who calls us to be his own. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what I want you to see is that we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and we are now the righteousness of God. When the Lord looks at me and when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not your ability to do anything. Not my ability to do anything because really, guys, we bring nothing to the table, right? It's it's the Lord. And so when, when he looks at us, we are cleansed by the righteousness of Jesus. So yes, in the eyes of God, he has a very attractive bride without spot or wrinkle. And it's hard for us to realize that because we know how many spots and wrinkles exist. Look at verse 22. When the camels had finished drinking, The man took a gold ring weighing half a shekel, two bracelets for her arms weighing 10 gold shekels, and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I'm the daughter of Bethulel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. I love this. The servant, the picture of the Holy Spirit, when he finds the bride, what does he immediately do? Give her gifts. What does the Spirit of God do for those who are believers in Christ Jesus? He endows us with spiritual gifts. You can find them in Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12. The gifts of the Spirit. And he gives them out as he wills to the people of God. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? Have you ever taken a spiritual gift assessment? If you have not, man, you need to let me know. I need to get one of those in your hand, ASAP, so that you can see where God has gifted you maybe, where he's opened up some things into your life that, man, it's just the way that he's made you and designed you and created you. You need to look into that. Let me know. Really, when we get done, let me know because I want to let you have a a spiritual gifts assessment because maybe you've been serving in all the wrong places, right? Maybe you have. Maybe there's something that's more suited to who you are. We just need to take a look. Verse 26, the man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness towards my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. People often wonder how God will lead them, right? Should I take this job? Should I marry this person? Should I try to take on a new ministry? Right, all of these questions exist in our head, or at least if you're a spiritual person, they should exist in your head. You should be one who wants to do things that are pleasing to God, right? Or, right, am I the only one? Right, are, you too, yes? You want to know what, how God wants to lead, and you want to do the right thing. But sometimes we get this paralysis of analysis where we're looking at, at everything around us and wondering, is this the right way? Is that the right way? Is this what I should do? Or is this what, how do I discern the will of God? 
because we want to be those that walk in the will of God, right? We want to be those that are walking in a way that's pleasing to God, but it's hard to know sometimes because there's a lot of things out there that's not written in ink in our Bibles that tell us what we should do. We have principles that we live by. We have um, the, the doctrines and we have the theology that, that make up our belief system, but sometimes it just doesn't write out for us on the wall like we would want it to in big crayon letters what we should do. So what do you do in that? I, I love how Abraham's servant prayed here. He says, the Lord has led me in the way. The Lord has led me in the way that I should go. Now, how did he know that until after the fact, right? And I think that's the whole point. It's always after the fact. The phraseology is so incredible because one of the things uh, that Jesus said about himself, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? Right? Do you know what early Christianity was called before it was called Christianity? The way, right? The phraseology just stands out to me here. So back to the question at hand, how do I know if I'm walking in the will of God? How do I know if I'm doing those things that are pleasing to God? Here's the thing about the will of God. It's not hidden from you. It's not like one day you're going to lift up the sofa and say, there it is. It's been hiding all along. Now I've got it. No, think about what Romans chapter 12 says. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may what? Prove the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. You see, the will of God is not discovered, it's proven. There's going to be times when you have to make a decision in life and it's just going to be you making a decision. It's not going to be based on anything besides the fact of this seems right to me in the Holy Spirit that I should go in this direction. This makes sense to me as a person. This makes sense to me as a Christian. This is, follows the principles of God the best I know how. You see, because when it comes down to it, God's going to prove his will through the choices that we make. God can prove his will through the boneheaded choices that we make. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Because I'm going to tell you, it's all the boneheaded decisions I made in my life that I'm sitting in this chair right now talking to you. Do you understand? God used all of that to prove his will today and continues to prove it as we move forward. Don't get so frozen thinking, oh, I, I, I've juggling, I gotta find the will of God. Is it this way, this way, or this way? Stop, pray, know the word of God, and make a godly decision based on what you know. It's okay. It's not like God is sitting up there with his celestial hammer saying, I can't not wait for them to make a wrong move because I'm gonna flatten them. No, that's not how it works. And I wish I could tell you that everything that you need is just written in black and white, but that's just not the way that it is. We have our principles that we live by. We have the doctrine and the theology that makes up our belief system. But there are things that slide through the cracks when we're needing some very specific answers to some very specific questions to make some very specific decisions. And God is saying, well, make your choice. I'm going to prove my will through whatever you do. I'm going to prove it. And I hope that is the weight off of somebody's shoulders tonight. That you're thinking you've got to make just the right decision at just the right time. Listen, pray, know the word, make a decision. The will of God is proven, not discovered. Know that. Look at verse 29. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. Now you want to mark this guy's name because this guy turns out to be a crook, okay? Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arm, you catch that, right? When did he start running? When he saw all the treasures and the gifts, right? That's when he come running. And he heard the words of Rebecca, his sister. Thus spoke the man to me. 
He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder to the camels. And there was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I've said what I have to say. Oh boy, he said, speak on. <laughs> right? We're hungry, speak on. Did I tell you one of the first times I ever preached was in a uh, soup kitchen? Um, I did not realize that they could not eat until I got done speaking. <laughs> and I don't preach long, y'all. <laughs> But I, I was giving these guys a breakdown of Psalm 23. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And this guy yells out from the back, would you shut up? <laughs> Let us pray. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm telling you, you can only endure so long, right? Well, whew. upon returning home to her mother, were introduced to the shady, scandalous Laban, right? Rebecca's brother. Laban's a very worldly man. He, 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 what caught his attention was the gifts, the gold, right? And he's looking for an edge. Laban is always looking for what's going to be good for Laban and not for everybody else. Laban, and you're going to see this. Laban doesn't disappear after this story, y'all. Just like people like Laban never disappear. They're always there. They're always watching, always looking for something that's going to benefit them. So in verses 34, all the way through, through 49, the servant retells the story of how he found Rebecca at the well. And in short, he's saying, you've heard my story. You've seen the miraculous way that God does what God does. Now, are you going to let Rebecca marry my master's son, Isaac? He's really getting down to brass tacks. Are you going to let this happen? Now, if you want to go back and read that at your own leisure, the servant's story looks totally different. Remember when he was praying, God, please provide this woman for my master, Abraham. Now, when he retells it to Laban, he's like, yeah, I was sitting out there and I just saw this girl. and I thought that's the one. Yeah, it's so funny, right? It's funny because we do the same thing. Right. Some of the commentators would say, oh, he, he's trying to be culturally correct to the people that he's talking to. And I'm like, no, forget that. That brother's trying to pat himself on the back. That's what he's doing. So verse 50, Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother, remember who's her brother? Laban. Her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. Merry Christmas. And, and the men who were with him ate and drank and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Her brother and mother said, let the young woman remain with us for a while, at least 10 days. After that, she may go. What did I tell you? Laban's always trying to sneak something. He, I know he's trying to sneak something. And, and he says, just let her stay for 10 days. Just 10 to, You go on back and let her stay for 10 days. Laban has no intention of letting his sister go, right? No intention. But he said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, let us call the young woman and ask her. Crooked, man, I'm telling you, crooked trying to get her to stay he's already got all the gifts now he's trying to get him her sister to stay his sister to stay well they called rebecca verse 58 and they said will you go with this man and rebecca's lived in this family for a while y'all she says i'll go <laughs> i'm ready i'll go 
So they, Rebecca's never seen this man in her life, but she is willing to marry a man she has no idea. She's just seen the, the rings of gold and the ornaments of silver. Yeah, I'll marry him. Reminds me of a story. Um, I don't know if I've told you all this story or not. It doesn't matter. I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> young girl looks at the young man. And the young man says to her, Honey, I may not be able to buy you a mansion like Johnny Green can. I may not be able to buy you a fancy car like Johnny Green. I may not be able to take you on all these extravagant vacations like Johnny Green, but I will love you with all my heart. And she said, That is so sweet. Tell me more about Johnny Green. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here, right? He says, I don't know this guy. I don't know anything about him, but I will marry him, and I want out of this house. Verse 59, they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went on his way. You know what I like about that? The fact, the fact that she is willing to be the bride of a man she's never saw. Let's keep the analogy. We've not seen the Lord Jesus, but yet the church is the bride of Christ. And there's going to be a day when the bridegroom calls the bride to be with him. You see, we, we, we've seen the gifts, right? We've seen the glimpses of what the Lord has done in our lives. We know by faith what he's done for us, but we've not yet seen him face to face. Oh, what a glorious day that will be when the Lord calls his bride to be with him and we get to see him face to face the one who gave his life for us, the one who gave his everything so that we could be connected to him. And there's going to be this wedding feast, the Bible tells us. The wedding feast of the Lamb. And guess who is the guest of honor? We are. We're the bride. And the bride will be presented to the bridegroom and is going to be a glorious, glorious day. You know, when you look at these analogies and you connect it back to where we are now, how incredible is it going to be to see the one who has made all of this possible for me and you? Oh, my goodness. We've not seen him, yet we love him. Verse 62. Now, Isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward the evening. He lifted up his eyes, and he saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes when she saw Isaac. She dismounted from the camel. Now, right there is when I wish I was reading the King James Bible. Because you know what it says? This is the old joke that Rebekah was a smoker because she lit off her camel. That's what happened right there. <laughs> oh my some of y'all are looking up king james version right now yes she lit off of her camel verse 65 and said to the servant who is that man walking in the field to meet us so she had a who's that man moment right she sees him she's in love the servant said it's my master so she took her veil and covered herself and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. I love how this account of Isaac and Rebekah's marriage ends with that phrase, he loved her delightful woman she's comforted uh, he's comforted by her love after the death of his mother and now Isaac is positioned to take on the patriarchy of the family right Abraham has one son of promise and that is Isaac and Isaac will step into that lead role to carry 
the blessing of God into the rest of the world. Remember, the whole point was for every family in the world to be blessed through the, the offspring of Abraham. So here we see that actually starting to take place here. So Isaac brought Rebekah into Sarah's tent. Now, if we're going to keep the picture going, Sarah would be a picture of Israel. Rebekah represents the bride of Christ. Rebekah is not Sarah, but she's brought into the place where Sarah lived. You know what the Bible says about the Gentiles? That's anyone who's not Jewish. We were brought in. We're not Israel. We're not. The church is not Israel. But we were brought and grafted in. We're part of the tree now. We're, we're part of, of what God has brought in to be his bride. You see, if Israel's the mother, the church is the bride, and he, we're not the same. There are, are promises for Israel and Israel alone. There's promises for the church and the church alone. One of the worst things we could ever do is have this, this kind of displacement theology where we think that we're Israel, we're the future Israel. That just gets all weird and goofy when you start following it down the trail and trying to make those connections. You have to say the church is the church and Israel is Israel and God is not done with either yet. God is not done with Israel. He's not done with me and you. I mean, the bride of Christ may move into that place where Israel once was, but not Israel. And so from this portion of Scripture, we learn a great deal about God, not through His speaking, because He's silent through this whole story, but it's the unseen hand of God's providence moving behind the scene, right? There's people praying, there's people asking God of things, and without saying a word in Scripture, these people find themselves exactly where they need to be, fulfilling the promises exactly as God gave them. Do you see how He works these things out, how the will of God is proven not discovered. So now we move into chapter 25. So here's a bunch of weird names I'm going to read. I may not say them right, but you won't know. I'm, <laughs> I might nail a few of these, right? I, it may be right on the money. So <laughs> Abraham took another wife. What? Hold on. Let me read that. I mean, right at the first, the, the first verse of chapter 24 said Abraham's old and decrepit. Well, he's advanced in years. The first verse of chapter 25 says Abraham takes another wife. Are you kidding me? This guy is a hundred and whatever. And get this. 30 plus. He takes a wife whose name is Keturah and she bore him. What? <laughs> she bore him Zimran. Jokshan, Medan, Marcel, uh, <laughs> Odell, Adel, all the Odell brothers, Ishbak, Shua, six sons. He had six kids with this woman. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. At his age. My goodness. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were this guy and that guy. The sons of Midian were Ephah and Ephah and Hanok and all those other children. <laughs> all these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham, verse 5, gave all he had to Isaac. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac, eastward towards the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. Man, Abraham went out strong, didn't he? Man, look. And in our day of, of blended families, we easily forget that Old Testament family dynamics were complicated too, okay? Because you've got guys having children by wives and concubines, multiples of each. Who gets the inheritance? So what does Abraham do when the other kids get old enough? Sends them off. That's what he does. And he gives everything he has to Isaac. 
because he's learned his lesson. This is the promised child. I'm just going to give him everything I've got. And he does. But with Sarah now dead and Isaac married to Rebekah, the stage is set and Abraham's life comes to an end. And the Bible says he died at a good old age. 175, good old age, right? Ripe old age. Now, that's just not saying that he lived a long time because he did live a long time. It's saying that the last part of his life was very good. It was very productive. It was a good part of his life. And unfortunately, old age is not automatically good. Do you know that? (laughs) You're like, you're telling me. (laughs) Look, 70% of Bible characters, 70% whose story is told from beginning to end, okay? Someone, you you know their story from beginning to end. 70% of those stories do not end well. They end bad. But thank the Lord that Abraham is showing us that you can live and end out life at a ripe old age. I like that. Old age, a guy said one time, is not so bad when you consider the alternative. For all the advances in medicine, there's still no cure for the common birthday. Harrison Ford said, you're getting old when all the names in your black book have MD after them. And a guy by the name of Paul Stevens says everyone wants to live longer, but nobody wants to get old. So true. So that ripe old age, the natural result of knowing and living out your purpose. Knowing and following God as you discover your purpose in life. And and at the end of life, a lot of people, I'll say a lot, a lot that I've known, have this tendency to put it in neutral and coast. What's the saying? I've done my time. Like, going, like, like church was a prison sentence to him. I've done my time. I'm just going to ease it out for the rest of my, of my days. But I think Abraham shows us something different. I think Abraham shows us a different picture here. This is a guy who went out strong. This is a guy who continued to try to fill the mandate of God by being fruitful and multiplying and, and caring for the promised seed as long as he possibly could. And it's important to know, especially for us uh, middle-aged guys, our purpose is not necessarily and always our occupation. But man, we sure try to make it that way. Right? You know how I know that? Someone says, oh, hey, my name's so-and-so. What's the next thing out of their mouth? I do this for a living, right? This is what I do. Or if we're wanting to get to know somebody, well, tell me what you do. But our occupation is not always our purpose. I mean, like right now, I can tell you, I'm a pastor. God has called me to be a pastor. And there is some purpose in that. But being the pastor is not the purpose of life. I love what I do. And I do it because God has gifted me and called me to do it. But at the end of the day, My ultimate purpose is to share the gospel. I'm a believer. Make disciples, right? I may be a preacher who makes disciples. You may be a welder who makes disciples. You you, you may be a work at a cash register and make disciples. It doesn't matter what the occupation is, but sometimes we get confused thinking our occupation is what our purpose is. No, that's just, that's what you do. That's what you do. Your purpose is who you are. What do you live for? Do you know not one spiritual gift listed in in Scripture is an occupation? Not one. And your occupation is an avenue for your purpose to flourish. So your occupation may change, but your purpose never will. And if life changes as you get older and you're not careful, you're going to feel left out because you're going to think, Just because your occupation isn't what it used to be, that you can't be who God has called you to be. But that's purpose. That is totally different than occupation. So don't put it in neutral. Let's put that baby in drive and keep moving. Right? I mean, if Abraham's 175 having kids, surely you can work some ministry, right? Or do some mission. So what do we do? 
Now, some of you have seen this, so don't give it away, okay? Don't give it away. First thing you want to do, assist the next generation. You need to assist the next generation. The things that you've been through, senior adults, younger adults need to know about it. Because we go through the same things that you've already been through, and we need to know how to navigate the waters. So for, an, for a senior adult to assist the next generation is to pass that wisdom down. Younger adults, don't be blockheaded. You need what these senior adults have to say. We need to know. But there has to be a purposeful traded off of listening and speaking to get this because no one's going to teach the next generation better than the ones who have already been through it. And I know what you're thinking. I've tried to tell you my whole life and you don't listen. You know how I know that? I've got kids. That's how I know. But the same God who led you in your early years is still the same God who's leading you now. And he's not asking you to quit. He's just asking you maybe to change the way that you're doing what you've been called to do. I want you to pour into the next generation. Assist them. What else can you do? Affirm the next generation. Now, affirming the next generation, that's countercultural to us. Because it's almost natural for one generation to disprove the generation behind them. Their haircut, their music, everything. Right? Come on, somebody. My dad ragged my haircut every time he got a chance. Because it just wasn't the way that his generation did. Right? I was Beatles. I had, I had long Beatle hair. That's what I wanted. Yeah. John, Paul, Sam. All, all the Beatles. Yeah. Right there. Ringo. For his generation, it was high and tight. That's what you did. Every, every guy got the same cut. Have you ever ragged on somebody for the haircut? I bet you have. I rag on my son for his haircut. It's like a rite of passage, right? What about the style, the clothes that you wear? Now, when I was a teenager, it was just start for us, for me, it was just starting to be the cool thing to have uh, holes in the knees of your pants. And my dad and my mom were like, you need to take those pants back. They got a hole in them. <laughs> you bought them like that? You spent money for that, right? It, it was one of those things. And like one generation just does not connect with the other generation. It it's countercultural to say that I'm going to affirm the next generation. But this is what I've found out. And, and, and I actually went to a class on this when I was, I was at the annual meeting the past Monday and Tuesday. And it was a class on connecting to the next generation. We've got to get past the preference stuff and get down to the, the heart of the matter. Where can we connect and how can I affirm you? I can affirm you in Christ Jesus. I can get past the music, right? I can get past the clothes. I can get past the haircut because I want to affirm you. If we're not affirming this next generation, if all we're doing is, is throwing darts at the next generation, how in the world can we expect them to lead us when they get to those positions? Because no matter how bad we don't want that or maybe think that's a terrible thing, they are going to be the next leaders. So then we need to do our job as believers at affirming that next generation. I know it's quiet, but I hope you're thinking on the inside, that's right. Well, I get it. You don't like it. <laughs> don't want to. That's right. I don't want to do that. Look. <laughs> My dad, man, he, God love him. He got saved in the last nine months of his life. He was in a wheelchair for 16 years. And uh, he watched my life transformed by the gospel. And it grabbed his heart as well. And for the last nine months of his life, he was a believer and went to church every Sunday, baptized in his wheelchair. Um, but for my dad, he had a hard time affirming the next generation. Especially some of my, my friends that had like facial piercings and things like that. You got to remember, I was a musician, so I was friends with guys that were pierced and tatted all over. And he's like, son, who's your friend that fell face first in a tackle box? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was my dad. 
I used to pick up this lady from church uh, when I was pastoring a, a, a church out in the Mississippi Delta, and her name was Sister Bingham. She was 89 years old, and I'd pick up Sister Bingham, and she didn't like my car. She didn't like the music that I had on the radio. She didn't care for my preaching, all that, and she'd let you know, I don't care for that all that much, all that, all that talking you do. <laughs> I was like, well, Okay. But it would never fail when she would get out of that car. She says, I thank God for you. I thank God for you. I'm thankful that he brought you here. Thank you for picking me up and giving me a ride. And I'm thinking, you just told me you don't like anything about me, but you thank God for me. But you know what? That stuck with me. It stuck with me. Just the way, the way that she said it, I could tell she was, it, it wasn't. Like all of her bickering, that was a different tone of voice than when it came to the end of the ride when she was saying, I thank God for you. It was sincere. It was to the heart. And she couldn't do, she couldn't do anything for me, but man, she surely affirmed me of thanking God for me, right? I appreciated her. What else can I do? What else can you do? We can resource the next generation. It's important to resource the next generation. Finances, time, gifting, you're able to do that. Um, Most people are able to do that. Uh, Ask God to help you recognize who needs your help. Who needs your help? Who's a younger couple that you could help resource them, spend some time with them, take them out to dinner, take them out to lunch. Help them at Christmas time with their kids. Because, you know, guys, you know what it's like. You know what it's like. You, you who've had kids that's left the house, I hope, I would hope that it's not a big a tug on your bank account as when they were kids living in the house. Maybe it is. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm just saying, when you have that opportunity and you have the ability to do that, do that. Resource the next generation. And the last thing is pray for the next generation. Probably the most overlooked responsibility, especially uh, uh, of of senior adult believers, is know that you need to to pray for the next generation. These are our our leaders. And I want the the last season of life for any of us to be just as strong as the beginning, if not stronger. To be like Abraham, the ripe old age, right? And so how do I remember all of this? Assist the next generation, affirm them, resource, pray for them, A-A-R-P. That's how you know. That's how you remember. <laughs> That's how you... I'm sorry. Oh, my. I'm going to leave that up there for a minute. Look at, <laughs> look at verse 9. Verse 9 Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him, Abraham, in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. And it goes on to talk about, all the way through verse 17, uh, that not only does Abraham pass away, Ishmael passes away as well. Uh, There's a lot of names in here, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to to, to move ahead a little bit. But what I want you to see is that despite Abraham's faults, flaws, and failures, God proves faithful to him. God proves faithful to him. God promised to bless Abraham. He did. God promised th- that the land he, he would live in would be the land that he was buried in with Sarah. He was. God promised a son through Sarah. He gave him that. God promised that Abraham would live to be a good old age. My goodness, he really did that. God promised Abraham that nations would come from him. We're going to see that happen. God promised Abraham that kings would come from him. We're going to see that happen. God promised that salvation and faith would continue from him into next generations. So with Abraham and Sarah and now Ishmael all gone Away from the story, now we focus on Isaac and Rebecca because they're about to have two sons. And I'm struggling here because I'm out of time, but man, I want to tell this story. Okay, let's do it.
All I needed was one person. That's all. Just one person. I'm a, I was waiting on it. All right, verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Armenian of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Armenian, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Remember, just like Sarah was. And the Lord granted his prayer. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Verse 22. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if this is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. And when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. <laughs> so they called his name Esau, which ironically means hairy. Um, afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob or heel snatcher, trickster. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful, skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in the tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Uh-oh. So let me recap. Rebekah can't get pregnant. Jacob, or, or, uh, Isaac prays for her. She learns she's having twins now, but they're warring inside of her. She says, something's not right going on inside of here. It's a war. These are two nations, God would tell her. Well, when she gave birth, the first baby come out looking like a juvenile Sasquatch, like Bigfoot, <laughs> hairy. Baby Elmo, born right there, red and hairy. <laughs> I just thought of that one. I'm sorry. The second child comes out grabbing a heel. So they name them very literally what they are. Harry and the Heel Snatcher. That's a band name if I've ever heard it. Harry and the Heel Snatcher. So for almost 20 years after their marriage, Rebecca is barren. But when she has babies, man, does she have them? She has twins and they war against one another. And not only did they war against one another, mom and dad take sides in this. Dad loved Esau because it's just easier to get along with Esau because they like the same things. Esau likes to hunt. I like to eat venison. Oh, this goes great together. I love Esau. But Jacob was, was more of a mama's boy, right? If, if Esau was the guy who liked to, to hunt and, and like kill and do all of the, the, he's the man's man, Jacob likes to bake cookies. Yeah, I mean, he likes to stay at home with his mom. He's mama's boy right? That's just who he is. And she loves him because he's easier for her to get along with. He helps me around the house, right? He helps me thread the needle when I sew. I don't know. She loves him. That's her boy. But, but this is a problem because we've seen this with Cain and Abel in their conflict. Isaac and Ishmael have their conflict. Now Jacob and Esau are having their conflict. Do you see how this is repeating itself over and over and over? And, and as we get to the end of the book of Genesis, there's a guy named Joseph, and all of his brothers hate him. So the, all of this family conflict is just coming to a head. And there's multiple sons, and they're having to work out their differences. And mom and dad, they're really, I, I hold Isaac and Rebecca to blame here more than anybody, because instead of making these boys sit down and resolve their conflict, what do they do? They take sides. And sometimes, as parents, I get it how this happens. Now, I'm just going to guess, because I have two kids, and I know how these kids work of mine. There's certain things they'll ask me for and certain things they'll ask mom for. Right? They're going to get the answer they want. They know if they go to dad and they're going to ask dad for this certain things, I'm more prone to give them the answer they want. And then they're going to go to mom for the, to get the answer they want there. But in this case, you actually had parents that were playing favorites. And what really should have been the answer 
is, is when, when mom and dad are favoring these two kids and these two kids go at odds with one another, guess what that does with mom and dad? That puts them at odds with each other. So what it really should have come down to is we're going to figure this out. But you've not seen this all through the Bible. We don't see it even a lot today where conflict is resolved. At best, we sweep it under the rug and act like it doesn't happen. Instead of dividing, they need to be uniting. Our job as parents, and you know this, is to lead our kids, not to follow them. And if they're fighting and you're dividing and they're leading, you're following. That's how it works if you've got kids. We're supposed to parent, not enable. And it takes faith to raise a son. It takes faith to raise kids. I'm supposed to be letting my kid drive right now. He still bumps in the wall walking down the hallway. <laughs> He's supposed to be driving. Scares me to death. We drive through the neighborhood. There's parked cars. We almost hit them. We, we're playing it safe. And my wife's like, no, you just need to get him out on the road. I'm like, okay, go ahead. <laughs> y'all, y'all go do that. It's scary. Raising kids is scary nowadays. I, I, you know, when you judge how you were raised versus how your kids were raised, man, it's a different world we live in. I used to leave the house in the morning. Nobody knew where I was all day. I'd come home at night. In fact, when I was growing up, it used to come on the news every night. Do you know where your kids are? <laughs> like they had to remind our parents, hey, you've got kids. They're gone somewhere. You don't know where they are. <laughs> Oh my. Look at verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which means red. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So as firstborn, the birthright, the right to carry on the godliness of the family line laid on Esau. But Esau's not the man for the job, obviously. He's selling his spiritual birthright, the blessing, for a bowl of bean soup. That's how much he despised the things of God, that it meant nothing to him. He could care less about it. I'm hungry. I want something to eat. Sure, I can't see this invisible birthright. Take it. He probably thinks he's getting a deal. And at the bottom of Esau's sins is this indifference about God's covenant to bless the nations through the patriarch. Right? Because if Esau takes it seriously, it should be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But it's not. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to be the way that it goes. Because Jacob... (sighs) as much of a trickster as he is, and we're going to see that next week. He's a big time trickster. He lives up to his name, the heel snatcher. I don't want you to go in the way of Esau to see these spiritual things as something that's easily given, take it on a whim, take it with a grain of salt. The things that we receive from the Lord are serious. They're they're, they're examples for us. It's for our living. It's for us to learn to live in a way that's godly and holy. And and we should take that serious. Because Esau didn't. And as we're going to see, it's going to end up tearing him up. It's going to eat him alive. That he feels like he's going to get cheated out of all this. Thank you for hanging on for a few more minutes while I finish that story. Hopefully you learned a little bit out of it and got a laugh or two as well. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. I thank you that it is a 
an agent of transformation for us, God. We're not supposed to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's what your word does. It renews our mind. You show us how you think and how we can get in line with the way that you see things, God. And I just pray that as your word says, as we do this, we will uh, prove your perfect and excellent will, God. It'll be proved as we look back through the history that is our life and we'll see how you moved and had your being in the, in the things and the choices that we've made and the way that we go. And we can give you all the glory for how you've done what you've done. Father, keep us safe as we make our way home. Bring us back again to get into your word. Thank you for illuminating us to see you through the pages of Scripture. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 